Thank you.
50 horsepower tractor is going to be around $35,000. Then <laughs> uh, some things that come up, you know, back in them days it wasn't uncommon for kids to work on the farm. Other than my kids do it now. It's practically illegal now. Times change and move on. I say it's a big thing. It wasn't a big deal years ago to get out of school to go work around your harvest and take your cattle to the cell. Think along that line, and nowadays you kind of get the evil eye when you tell the principal of school that you're going into the help get cattle and do a sale out there. So it's not a good excuse anymore. <laughs> Oh, just a couple of interesting things that I've got to come up with. Yeah. Yeah, that might be kind of interesting. Uh, next, our guest speaker, time to be my aunt, Lydia Burks. She's kind of saving my butt on this field. I'm trying to put together quite a presentation. And, uh, my grandpa is going to help me. Visiting with my aunt Debbie about some of this stuff, and she said, How about I just do it? Debbie Burgess? Thank you, Will. I'm not sure I exactly said, Well, here, let me do this. Um, I was trapped in a recycling trailer, and those of you that know me, I do a lot of recycling for the county, and I was sorting things out, and when you look out of the recycling trailer, all you see is the silhouette. And then walked the silhouette and started talking about this, and it turned out to be Will. And uh, he did want dad to help him with this, and like he said, my dad went and here was not able to do that tonight. So I said, well, this is some things I'd like to do, or I could do, and he says, oh, that sounds fine. So I called Brenda, and she says, oh, that sounds fine. So I hope I can share a few things with you tonight. Um, my dad told me when he started school, the school bell rang at 8.30. And that was to call in all the kids from around the countryside because there were no school buses. And so the bell rang at 8.30 that told them they needed to get their butt on the way to school. And then at 9 o'clock, the bell would ring again and classes would start for the day. Um, even though Bill kind of twisted my arm to be up here, it is an honor because I am a descendant of one of the first two graduates from Omega, or from Wheaton High School, and I think my aunt Vera Kenneberg Martin will talk about those two graduates a little more in detail when her class is recognized. Um, but I did put together a few things of the past 100 years. And one of the graduates was Clara Ward Dixon. Now, I dabble in a little bit of family history, as some of you know. And I'm not sure why I ended up with this particular book, but Clara Ward Dixon was a poet. And she wrote quite a few poems. And when I was going through this book, I ran across this poem. And remember, this was from a graduate in 1913. And the poem is titled, To the Wheaton High School Alumni. Oh, let us all, let us all together turn time's hand back again to the youth's fair land enchanted. Be glad as we were again. We'll slip past disappointments, past days we lived in vain. Forgetting all our sorrows and all we know of pain. In youth's most lovely Eden, we'll wander side by side. To seek again laughter, we often have denied. I wave my wand enchanted. I summon you at will. Tonight I'll meet you, greet you, on memories started hill. Now, I did not graduate from here, but when I walked in tonight and looked around, how many of you were sharing memories tonight with some of your graduates or graduates a year ahead of you or behind? It was delightful to listen to all of you. Now, as we shared for the class of 1968, how many 
time you find your memories are changing just a little bit. Some of the stories I thought I knew have a different interpretation by some of my classmates. But I think that's all part of memories. And talking with Brenda today, or the other day, she said to me, life is all, is all about memories. And we need to share those memories. And I think she's right. We need to share what we remember, even if it's a little changed over time maybe a little embellished over time, that's okay. Uh, and tonight, as I share some things, they are going to be generational. Because my grandmother was one of the first graduates, Esther Forrest Hinneberg. And uh, I will let Aunt Mira talk a little more about that, but I do want to recognize that Esther Forrest Hinneberg and Louis Hinneberg, who graduated in the class of 1914, had seven children that graduated from here. And we have two of those children with us tonight, and I'd like to have Edith Stan and Aunt Vera. Okay? Thank you. Now, Aunt Eva moved away, but Aunt Vera stayed around here with her husband, Orville Martin, who I think graduated in 1941, maybe? And they had four children. And two of those children are here tonight, Ruth and Joe. So if you two would stand. Now, what is special about Ruth is she did graduate from Wheaton. Uh, what is special about Joe is she did not. <laughs> she was the end of the unification year. Uh, now, my own dad, Milton Hinneberg, had five children, and none of us graduated from Wheaton. Uh, all of us were either the unification group I got here as a junior in high school, but had I stayed, or had we stayed, we would have had Esther Hinneberg and Louis Hinneberg, Milton Hinneberg, us five kids, but I'm going to focus on Woody. Then we would have had Woody, and then we would have had William. And that's how William ends up being here tonight, as your chairperson. <laughs> it's generational. And he does have four boys, and probably one of them will end up here someday. Um, of Dad's five kids, we didn't go very far. Most of us are around here, so if he had a school, stayed at school, probably most of us would have gone to school here at Wheaton and would have graduated from here. I would like to share with you some of the first graduates, and if you are a descendant of any of these people, please stand up. The graduates of 1914 was Christine Swicker Underwood, Lula Force McCarty. Okay, she's an aunt to any of you, and there's several forces here. Go ahead and stand up. Lula Force McCarty. Very good. And then Lewis Hinneberg. You are a descendant of the related to Lewis Hinneberg. Okay? Francis Hinneberg Carter. The same bunch. Laurel Campbell Granger. Josie Lolly Wagner. From 1916, Marie Campbell, Marie Martin, Emma Swickert, 1917. And 1917 is an interesting year because in that year, the school board, board voted to turn Wheaton High School into a four-year accredited high school. And when we became accredited, then we had to go to school for nine months. Prior to that, we were going to school for eight months. And in that year, they had two, two graduates, Myra Campbell and Dewey Goodman. Are there any relatives of Dewey Goodman here? I remember Dewey because he was an alpha here, I believe. Now, an interesting thing Dad told me about that year was that was the, 1917 was the first year for high school boys basketball. And there were only four boys available to be on the basketball team. 
So they used Professor Sutcliffe, the high school principal superintendent, and the grade school principal to round out the boys' basketball team, according to my dad. And let's see, I'll tell you later on really quick. And then in 1918, we had Rose Goodman Henderson, Mildred Sidney Whitley. You have a red relative. Uh, Geneva Stricker Keeney and Lloyd W. Force was in that class. However, he left his senior year to enter into the Navy as it was World War I. And then the first Wheaton High School alumni banquet was held in 1919. And those graduates were Nora Keating Cunningham. And I think there's some relatives here, descendants of Nora. Go ahead and stand up. Very good. Let's give her a round of applause. And James Keating, Meyer Robbins, and Catherine Tunison Clark. Is any relatives of Catherine Tunison? We'd be cousins. We'd be cousins. <laughs> so we're kind of generational here. And that's all the years I've been taking you because I think those are kind of, kind of fun years. Um, now, I went to the index of the alum of the, uh, your yearbook, and so the families kind of stand out as having had a lot of members go through here. So if you were a member of this family, go ahead and stand up. Abbotses. <laughs> How many Abbotses are here? Very good. Now, we need to wait till we get to the end, because I've got a couple names here. How many Bennets? How many of how many you remember the Bennets? If you remember Raven King. Yeah, the Bennets. Bossies. Any Bossies here? Yeah. Cunningham. You know this one here? How many Falls? Stand up if you are in the Falls. There's a lot of folks in your book. Thank you. How many figgies? <laughs> and Susan, why well, I like your Susan? How many forces? Okay. How many goodness? Harrington's? Hennepers? <laughs> uh, Corbin's? Keating's? Thrones. And I have to mention the four Crone girls singing here tonight would have been Alice Crow's great granddaughters. Is that right? Let's give them another round of applause. How many Koofalls? I think Koofalls actually had the most names in the book. How many Martins? Martins. How many Moxies? How many Pearsons? How many Swans? How many Smiths? Testies?
Custodians know everything, and they are the most confidential people, except maybe for school secretaries in the TRR world. Now, we didn't have school secretaries in this book, and I doubt if we have a school secretary, because I don't remember one. Does anyone? But if you remember these custodians, wave your hand. Carlisle Pierce. Now, he was the first custodian back in 1913, so... <coughs> Probably you don't. Henry Bushy, Fred Hop, oh, oh, Hoppy, Hoppy, Aunt Vera, do you remember him, Wilma? Fred Hoppy. That's a janitor. Janitors are among the most important people there are in the school building. That's kind of site. J.C. McCoy, anyone remember him? Jesse Souther. Oh, okay. What year is this? Jesse Seven. Those of you holding your hand, what year are you? Early? Tip what? Taylor was the Tip Taylor was the in the school, so the actually graduated. Okay, about what year, Ernie? Well, it would have been about 1970, somewhere down there. Okay, light 40s. For Jesse Sutter, Clarence Northup. Okay, Tom White. Tom White. Jack Gibbard. <laughs> and the last one they have listed is Otto Abbott. How many of you remember Otto Abbott? Yeah. Uh, I just remember how kind he was and his, his, the eyes that he had. And along with Otto Abbott's, the next most important people probably in the school for some of us uh, were the cooks. Now, how many of you did not have school lunches when you went to school? Okay. Dad told me he always, I think it was Dad, uh, he always envied the, the kids that had peanut butter, or had bologna sandwiches. Because he always had peanut butter sandwiches, is that right? <laughs> he said he always had peanut butter sandwiches, so he couldn't wait to grow up and have a bologna sandwich. <laughs> so, um, but Jesse Abbott was one of our cooks. How many of you remember Jesse Abbott? Yeah. And I think Elsie Patman cooked with her, for those of you that remember Elsie. Um, one group that is hugely important in any school system, and Lots of times they don't get the credit that is due to them, and of course part of this group would have been in a group that saw the closing of Omega, or of Wheaton, and the consolidation of Omega, and that are our, that, those people are our school board members. So if you're a descendant of any of these school board members, just put your hand up. And the first ones were Otto Hemberg, George Inglesby, H.E. Forbes, C.R. Huggins, E.W. Andrew, George P. Monroe, G.E. Graham, E.J. Adams, Ray Forbes, Alfonso Kufal, Wallace D. Biddle, William Clark, F.G. Force, L. Rebecca Henneberg, which is Lewis Henneberg, uh, Frank Cunningham, J.J. Kentworthy, uh, Reinhard Mosky, Raymond Goodman, Otto Abbotts, Faye DePue, L. W. Poteet, Arthur Toothaker, B.J. Glannon, Charlie Wilson, Vernon Kufal, Bob Motsky, Milton Henneberg, Lyle Kufal, and I think Lyle is here tonight. We should give him a special round of applause. Let's give Renita a round of applause. And 
And for me, the fall for is she here? That's all in the time of the world. Now you'll notice there's a single woman on that board on any of those boards of education. Not a single one. And that has changed a little bit over time. So that's a little bit on who was around for our school and got us started. Now, how many of you rode a school bus to school? How many of you walked to school? <laughs> how many of you rode a horse to school? How many of you rode in a buggy to school or a wagon or other contraption? Okay. <laughs> how many of you rode in a car to school? And then we finally evolved into the school bus. So a school bus is a relatively new thing. How many of you that rode the school bus remember your first bus driver? Who was it, Ruth? Mr. Gephardt. Oh, Mr. Gephardt. We had a Mr. Walker, who I think taught my industrial arts here. And you know, as a young girl being on that school bus, I just thought he was the most handsome person in the whole world. <laughs> So I was excited to go to school just to see my bus driver. Um, I wonder how many kids say that today. <laughs> my dad wanted to share a couple things in regard to 1945-46, which was at the end of World War II. And the Allies, who were us, were fighting them through the axes of Germany, Italy, and Japan. And he mentioned to me that his commerce teacher was Lena Zanaki, an Italian. She also taught English. The basketball coach, PE teacher, and history teacher was Sammy Hasegawa, who was Japanese. Now, it makes the story sound better to say C.E. Peterson, who was the principal, was German. But Dad didn't know that for sure. Uh, but it kind of points out that we were an integrated world for back then. Uh, he did say that they played basketball in above Higgins grocery, Higgins grocery store in the court down there. And at uh, 320, the bell would ring. And twice a week, the girls would run down there and practice basketball. And three times a week, the boys would run down there. And then they'd switch back and forth. Um, and he said at 4 o'clock, the school bell rang again, and if you were walking home, you could stay and have extra basketball practice. I didn't ask him how long the coach was willing to stay into the night, but he said as long as kids were there practicing, they were, he was okay with that. Um, they played Lillis. How many of you know where Lillis is at? <laughs> how many of you went to Lillis a lot when you were in school? <laughs> uh, Blaine. Probably upstairs in the, uh, at the top of the schoolhouse that has been raised over there. Fostoria, Emma, and Havensville. Uh, he remembers a couple of other teachers in grade school, Martina Keating and Felista Bennett. Do any of the rest of you remember those teachers? Okay. And in high school, Marcella Kennedy and a Philip Netherland. He remembered of his teachers. I was in the unification class. Uh, I went to Omega as a junior. Now, look around this room. This, uh, this gymnasium was important to us. How many of you can just think back to when you were in school and see yourself sitting someplace in here? Now, who wants to tell us where you see yourself sitting at? <laughs> uh -huh. Lamont was sitting right over here in Peplum. I remember sitting right over here in my Kelly Green Peplum outfit that we all had to have matching and make sure it wasn't too short. And we would sit over there cheering. And uh, we couldn't wait for those nights of basketball. And how many of you have cheered? I have to tell the story because this is a really small building now. So when I was really little, I was the mascot. running across to get to my mom and dad from the cheerleaders when they were playing basketball. 
You talk about a spanking. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I remember most about this building. <laughs> How many of you remember climbing the ladder to get up above and watch them up, up above there? You know, I don't think anybody ever fall, fell off, to my knowledge. Or, uh, Ernie fell off? Okay, yeah, Ernie says the first class to graduate in this building was 1950. Very good. I got to play basketball in it, but my basketball career was very short lived. Uh, how many of you play half court basketball? Girl, women. That's what we play. Um, some of the other things that stood out, stand out in my mind, is the stage and freshman initiation. Now, how many of you went through freshman initiation? And for the teachers in the group, how could, we would never get by with that now. I remember having to walk through eyeballs and I don't know what all up on the stage, and we were so glad it was over. And we were so thankful because we had brownies, we had special brownies for our treat. They were raised with um, x lax <laughs> So it was just good they did this on a Friday night. <laughs> I remember study hall, and uh, our class, we have a difference of opinion of who exactly was playing cards when Glenn Terrell caught us. But if you remember the stone built, the, the uh, brick building, you had the stairways and you could walk up, and then there was that banister where the principal could sit and watch you. And freshmen sat in the first two rows, and then sophomores and juniors and seniors. And um, evidently, we, some of us, we're not sure who all right now, but I remember writing this. Uh, he just simply walked in the room, and on that old blackboard wrote 5,000 words tomorrow. And he had 5,000 words the next day. I'm not sure any of us told our parents, because in those days, if you went home, and we're in trouble in school, how many of you would have been in more trouble at home? You, you didn't, you tried to get, try to keep it from your parents. So it's probably good that dad's not here. Um, I also remember in study hall, you know, we were in the unification group, but the building was also condemned. How many of you remember being able to see out daylight to see the cracks in the walls? And there would be little, sometimes there would be a little bit of snow that would blow in, especially on the windows. And I remember that. How many of you remember music? We had such wonderful instruments. We had sticks and triangles. Now, how many of you played the sticks? I was a stick player. How many of you got to play the triangles? Because you can make a little bit better music than a stick. I think that's why I didn't try out the band when, I, when we consolidated. I was too embarrassed to tell them that my only experience was with sticks. Um, and then, how many of you remember Miss Catherine Meyer? Okay. <laughs> she probably was the best typing teacher ever. But how many of you remember her being very stern? You weren't going to mess around in there, and if you remember where typing was at, he was in the northeast corner. And there was these wooden doors, and the top of these windows were cranked open for air. Well, why did she get out of the room? Because she never left the room. But one day she was out of the room, and Lyle Figgy and Ronnie Abbott decided to take their typing paper and fold it into paper airplanes. Do you all remember that? Oh, I do. And they were buzzing around the room, and one airplane just went <laughs> right into the study hall room. I, to this day, I don't know what, what Catherine did, because um, I think we were all too terrified. And then another time when she was gone, Ronnie Abbott took his typewriter apart. Remember that? <laughs> he took the roller out of the typewriter and couldn't get back. And when Miss Meyer walked in, we were all sitting there like, once again, I don't know what happened, but I just remember those two things from my typing class. Debbie, she was so strict. She stopped Dale Biggie from throwing a typewriter through one of those cracks. 
<laughs> well, you know, how many of you remember spending hours and hours and hours trying to type those perfect papers? And she'd hold them up to the light, and she'd say, oh, I see where you erased there. And then we'd have to do it again. Uh, think how lucky these kids are today that they have their computers to fix everything. And how many of you think we're better spellers than our grandchildren that are on the computers? We've come a long way. I can remember chewing tobacco and spit in a flower pot. <laughs> Speech 
along to me that I that I gave on graduation night, but I'm not going to give it. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Uh, the graduating class of 43, you have the names on the back of your uh, Margie Ann Lally, William Walsh, Alvin Marcy, Dorothy Tunison, Rudolph Hecker, and myself, Vera Hennifer. And as freshmen, we had Dick Heating, Joe Wilson, Harold McAtee, Alice Keeper, and Ora Sinclair. And for some reason or other, they all dropped out. Uh, our teachers, when we were seniors, was uh, Arthur Maston. Uh, Dolores Marr, and she was a sister of Kathleen, and Mary, or Margaret Fay. Next, Margaret Fay was our class sponsor, and she taught me this to peek up to get our senior pictures taken. And about three weeks ago, uh, Mary Margaret Fay called me, and we had a visit on the telephone. She was 96 on the 12th of May. She lives in Kansas City, and she's doing real good. She never married, and she only taught of me in one year, but she had a sister that died during that time, and her parents, parents were so grieving so that she thought she'd better go back to Kansas City next year. And the reason she had left for Kansas City was she had a brother that would have to go to her, and she didn't be on the school her. But, uh, um, and our, our the Illumina Banquet when we, in 1943 was held at the Congregational Church Basement. And that year, the Juju Senior Banquet, we really traveled. We went to Frankfurt to the Barrett's Coffee Shop. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to go backwards a little bit now. Going back to 1939, all the county graduates, eighth grade graduates, were invited to the at Westy by the superintendent, Howard Rose Stone. This was on a Saturday, and we were invited to a movie, and then at 2.30 we went to the courthouse bandstand where we got our diplomas. And Joe Nickel was a news commentator at that time, and he was the speaker. And the music was by the Flush Community Orchestra. Uh, this was for both eight-month schools and nine-months. And how many eight-month schools do you think there were in Prado County in uh, 1939? Twenty-five. <laughs> uh, I just had some, uh, have a letter that was written by Eula Tibbetts and then a little bit of notes by uh, Clara Ward. And in 1889, the Union Sunday School, which was organized about 1872, in a schoolhouse on the present Arlo Fisher farm, moved to Wheaton when the schoolhouse was moved. There's, this school would have been Caddy Wampus, you might say, from the Congregational Cemetery. Yeah, um, that's what's good. Let's see what else I got. Oh, um, Clara Ward was born on the farm where Tammy and Alan lived, which we just been east of the uh, cemetery, and my mother uh, was born where, our, where Alan Fisher was able to leave the south. So they were good friends, went to school for 12 years, and, and uh, were good friends. And at one time, I had the picture of her up here in, on the table, and Francis and George brought uh, Clara to visit mom, and she was at my house, and I had that picture, and I said, maybe that ought to go to one of your grandchildren or your children. He said, no, that belongs in your family. And so we have it tonight. And, uh, and like I said, my mother was in the first class. And the first year or two was held in the back of the church, which was located right about here where we are. And then each year they added the class and the new building was built. And, uh, and as Debbie has mentioned, it, Dad yeah, was also a graduate and we seven kids. And I think Ruth, uh, my sister Faye was the first, second generation, and Ruth the first, third generation, and William is the fourth generation. Uh, and this, I, I thought it was a real special uh, time when my mother was out of high school, 50 years that she graduated. 
and she and Clara Ward were here, and also Mr. Sutka, who was their superintendent.
have approximately 12 people, although we do have a couple others that aren't on here that we thought about this afternoon. Um, remember Stanley Gerber? He was in our first grade class, and he sat right in front of me. And I'll never forget, I'm pretty bashful, but this poor little kid sat there with his, his daddy cut his hair and he cut it clear down with a buzz, but there had to have been at least six bald spots that I had to look at every day. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, anyway, Bar uh, Beverly Martin lives in Tempe, Arizona. I live down by Meriden. Uh, Donna Magnet Schlorman lives in Topeka. Every Hanover lives in Omega. Uh, Wanda Mosky Magnet, and I'm sorry, I left off Burgess there. Every Hanover Burgess. Uh, Wanda Mosky Magnet lives here in, in Wheaton. Gail Kluval lives in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Lyle Piggy, I'm afraid we lost Lyle just this last year. But Sue is here with us. Lyle's wife. And Ronnie Abbott lives in Wheaton. Pat Keating is in Manhattan. John Blasky is in Omega. Richard Ellis, we lost him a few years ago. And Marie Philbom, although she's on here, I don't think she ever went to Wheaton School. Uh, she graduated from Omega, and I think she must have came her junior year, is what we're thinking. Lois Mittendorf used to be here, and she was. She was here with us our freshman year, we know that. Oh, and there are third Barrington, yes. And there's others. There was uh, Leo Barron. I have no idea what happened to him. Arthur Pearson was with us for a year or two. So there, there are more people than are on this list if they didn't graduate with us.
That's why I'm so smart, because I was learning in the fourth grade when I was in the first grade. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I'm visiting with some of my classmates and stuff, and uh, one thing that sticks out there is my wife now, she always is kind of a troublemaker, and uh, Dustin and I are good friends as well as the rest of my class. But for some reason, Dustin and I were always the ones that got in trouble and uh, got blamed for everything, even if we didn't do it. We knew we did be even in more trouble once we got home. But uh, this is just one time, uh, Mrs. Mc or Mrs. Calf at the time was our teacher. And I put a tack on her chair one day. And she was out of the room, and, uh, and Dustin and I saw it. He was like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble for that. So Dustin goes around up there, get that tack off of there. Well, and then Miss Cap came in at the same time, so he go under the desk. And up there. And there was a drawer sticking out of the desk at the time. Miss Cap, before she sat down, she slammed that drawer shut and slammed Dustin's fingers in it. And she <laughs> down the pipe. At the same time, all that was going on. So we got, we ended up getting in trouble anyhow. She grabbed both of us. I didn't need to do nothing. I didn't do nothing. <laughs> she grabbed both of us by the ear and uh, took us to Mr. Carlton's office. We both got a ringing over that deal. Thank you. 